Hello my beautiful watchers and welcome back to Lost in Adaptation, the internet review show about comparing film adaptations of books to said books to see if they did them justice. C.S. Lewis was a British writer who was, uh actually kind of a badass. While still a teenager, he fought in the frontline trenches during the First World War and was wounded in an explosion that killed several of his friends. Despite this, he still volunteered to serve during the Second World War decades later, though he was eventually turned down by the army and ended up helping out in other ways on the home front. Very impressively, Lewis taught English literature at both Oxford and Cambridge universities throughout his life. In case it's not widely known, Oxford and Cambridge were, and still are, two of the most prestigious universities in the United Kingdom, something the people who studied there are notorious for reminding the rest of the country of. Oxford Cambridge alumni are kind of like stereotypical vegans. You never remember asking, but somehow it always seems to come up at the start of every conversation. He was also famously very good friends of J.R. Tolkien, the author of The Lord of the Rings, and they allegedly check notes and proofread for each other on a regular basis. The Chronicles of Narnia are only one of several highly successful book series he wrote, though they are arguably the most famous these days. With Netflix cooking up a fresh attempt at an on-screen adaptation of these books, this seems like it would be a good time to have a look at one of their more successful past attempts. Truth be told, I might have been tempted to choose the slightly notorious BBC TV production from the 80s with the beautifully janky animatronic Aslan with the knees that didn't bend. because I have to admit it holds a very nostalgic place in my heart. Me and my big sister were really into those productions as wee nippers. But this, like almost every episode I do these days, is a Patreon-funded request, so they get to pick the incarnation. Let's talk about the 2005 big screen film adaptation. A combined Walt Disney Pictures and Walden Media production, they apparently decided to take a chance on a lesser known director from New Zealand by the name of Andrew Adamson. At the time, Adamson had a reasonable resume working various jobs in the film industry, but only had one admittedly very successful movie under his directorial belt. Despite this film doing very well at the box office, it does not appear that he went on to direct much more, which is a shame, though it looks like he went right back to producing and writing, so it's not like he faded away or anything. Okay, let's do the usual quick thoughts on the book and the film's individual merits before starting the comparison. So, the first thing that you have to know in regards to the works of C.S. Lewis is... <coughs> Actually, you know what, would you mind terribly if I didn't get into that whole thing in this video? I do enjoy talking about significant book features, but at the end of the day this is supposed to primarily be a review of how the book was adapted into a film, and this has the potential to be a bit of an episode-hogging tangent. As a compromise, perhaps I could recommend some videos that are specifically about that subject up there in the thing, just in case you're really curious about it. Moving on to some more personal experience-related stuff, the first time I experienced this book was when my father read it to me when my siblings and I were very, very young, and I do believe it's a huge contributing factor in my lifelong obsession with swords, which, if you've seen my latest Q&A, you'll know is getting a little out of hand. I've read it myself multiple times throughout my life, and the older I got, the the more I realised just how much Tiny Dom was accepting without question because it was part of a good story. Like Christmas and Father Christmas in Narnia, why would a dimension other than our own celebrate the birth of Christ or have a realised version of a tale that evolved from a guy called Saint Nicholas running around? Also, after spending years learning to fence, I started to wonder how the fuck 13-year-old Peter was so mad sick with a sword when he'd never so much as held one before in his life. I know the magician's nephew explained a lot about the relationship between Narnia and our world, and later books both explained and complicated matters further, but when just reading this first novel, gosh, it relies so heavily on Kid's complete lack of second guessing. But, I mean, it's a fairy tale. C.S. Lewis himself calls it a fairy tale in the rather touching dedication to his goddaughter. Standing up to scrutiny is not a requirement of a fairy tale. Sorry, I'm talking about incredibly superficial stuff here. For real, this is one of those classic books that very much deserves its legendary status. It's captured the hearts and minds of children and adults who wanted an easy read for almost 70 years now with Lewis's simple yet masterful writing style and groundbreaking creative concepts. I'd go as far as to say that C.S. Lewis was to whimsy what the invention of the tank was to warfare technology. Yes, there had been big advancements before, but it was still a game changer. I might have got a bit carried away with my metaphors here. Let's uh, move on to the film. 
Cards on the table, I didn't see this film or any of its sequels when they first came out. It wasn't that I wasn't interested, I just wasn't big into going to the cinema when I was an angsty teenager, and I've just never gotten around to it since. First impressions? Yeesh, this was a long film. I'm kind of glad I didn't see it in cinemas. More than two hours in one of those chairs can make my ass feel like I've been on the receiving end of one of Ben Affleck's paddlings and dazed and confused. I was not expecting to see baby-faced James McAvoy. Look at that cute little bugger. Aww. The child acting was a little cringy here and there, but for the most part, for child acting, I thought it was actually pretty damn solid. I was pleasantly surprised by that considering my open loathing for that sort of thing. The wee lass who played Lucy deservedly won some awards for her performance, I believe. The special effects have also held up way better than I would have expected. Not perfectly, but decently. Amusingly, the colour-keyed backgrounds, the relatively simple effect that requires little to no budget, hence why I use it in every video, was often what stood out the most as most unrealistic looking. Fun facts about this film, it was mostly shot in New Zealand, landscape porn capital of the world. The filmmakers attempted to import actual reindeer to pull these sleds around, but the government wouldn't allow it because that part of the world is super intense about what wildlife they let in for historically understandable reasons. The Chronicles of Narnia was always intended to be a multi-film production, but due to the kids needing to be at specific ages in different parts of the story, they had to film them pretty strictly in chronological order, which must have been a very expensive pain in the ass. As I said, it did very well in cinema shooting up to the number 24 spot in most profitable movies ever, and still holding within the top 60 to this day. Was this due to the film being a masterpiece in its own right, due to affiliation with its super popular book daddy, or a combination? Let's find out. <laughs> Praise Aslan, we have another adaptation that's loyal enough to its book that the not changed section is virtually a synopsis for the plot, which admittedly makes my claim of fair use a little more shaky, but let's not worry about that right now. Four young and precocious English children, Susan, Peter, Edmund and Lucy, are evacuated from London during the Second World War bombings. They're taken to a large mansion in the countryside that's owned by a weird but friendly old professor and housekept by a somewhat stern woman named Mrs. McCready. Lucy, the youngest child, comes across an old wardrobe in an unused room and enters inside, discovering that it has no back and instead opens out into a woodland covered in snow. Exploration quickly reveals a very out of place lamppost and a fawn named Mr. Tumnus, who, after being very shocked to discover that Lucy was a human, or a daughter of Eve as he refers to it, explains that she is in the magical land of Narnia and invites her to his home for a cup of tea. He plays a pipe for her and Lucy almost falls asleep to the music, but Mr. Tumnus suddenly has a change of heart about his actions and confesses to her that he is in the employ of a woman known as the White Witch, a powerful magic user who has crowned herself the Queen of Narnia and ordered all her servants to capture any humans that might enter her land. And deciding that said White Witch can go and bugger herself, Mr. Tumnus leads Lucy back to the lamppost and she goes back through the closet. To her surprise, her siblings claim she's only been gone a matter of seconds and don't believe a word of her story, especially after checking the wardrobe and finding it perfectly normal. Sometime, in a lot of teasing from Edmund later, Lucy once again returns to the wardrobe and finds the passage to Narnia has reappeared. Edmund sees her departing through it and follows suit. The lad is even more surprised to find himself there than she was and almost immediately meets the White Witch herself. She convinces him she's nice by magically creating a warm drink and a box of Turkish Delight. For those of you who are not aware, Turkish Delight, as the name implies, is a type of sweet that originated in Turkey, predominantly consisting of starch and sugar and often garnished with nuts. And he reveals to her that he's one of four children and talks about Lucy's friendship with Mr. Tumnus. She gives him directions to her castle and tells him that if he can bring all of his siblings there with him, him, she'll name him her heir and future king of Narnia. Right after she departs, Edmund meets Lucy returning from her fawn friend's house, who is delighted she finally has someone who can verify her claims. Unfortunately, the manipulative bugger decides to lie and tells Susan and Peter that Narnia really is a figment of their sister's imagination. Peter and Susan are so concerned about Lucy, they ask the professor for advice. He surprises them by pulling a Sherlock Holmes and saying that if Lucy is known for telling the truth and Edmund is famous for lying, then the only logical deduction is that Narnia is is in fact real. Sometime later, all four children are attempting to avoid Mrs. McCready and take refuge in the wardrobe. This time, the path to Narnia is there, and Peter and Susan apologise to Lucy for not believing her and chastise Edmund for being a lying creep. Lucy attempts to introduce them to Mr. Tumnus, but finds his cave house ransacked and a note saying he's been arrested by the Queen's secret police for aiding and abetting a human. A helpful Robin leads them to a talking beaver, who introduces himself as Mr. Beaver and invites them back to his damn home where his wife makes them dinner while they fill them in 
in on why everyone in Narnia is so excited about them. About 100 years ago, the White Witch had completely taken over, turning all who opposed her into stone with her magic wand, and casting a magic spell over the land so it would remain forever winter, but never Christmas. I'm not gonna lie, the never Christmas part doesn't sound awful to me. Bah. Humbug. The Queen had been successfully keeping the world subjugated ever since, but there were two popular prophecies about her downfall. One that four humans would arrive to overthrow her, and another that a guy called Aslan, the true King of Narnia, would return. After Mr. Beaver had explained all this and told them they need to meet Aslan at a place called the Stone Table, the group realised that Edmund had buggered off and realised he plans to betray them and all this information to the White Witch. He does indeed partake in this villainy, travelling to the Witch's castle and passing through her garden full of people she's turned into statues with her wand. And there he meets the captain of her fantasy Gestapo, who turns out to be a large wolf who agrees to take him to her. And the witch rewards Edmund for his efforts by taking him prisoner and sending her secret police to murder his family before setting off to cut them off from their destination personally. Not afraid to do her own dirty work, you've got to respect that in a despot. Fortunately, the siblings and the beavers evacuated their home before the wolves arrive, and partway into their journey to the stone table, they meet... um... Father Christmas as you do. Lord Commander Mormont here informs them that the witch's power is starting to weaken as the prophecies are starting to come true, so it's finally Christmas in Narnia. He then gives the four children special gifts that will help them on their quest. Peter gets a sword and shield, Susan a bow, and Lucy a small dagger and a cure-all wounds potion. Evidence of the waning of the witch's power continues as the further they travel, the more the snow around them melts. This prevents the witch from catching up to them before they arrive at Aslan's war camp. Aslan, who turns out to be a magnificent lion, welcomes the children and they explain about Edmund's betrayal, which Peter blames himself for for being so hard on him. Meanwhile, the witch is still working her way towards them, and Edmund gets himself bitch slapped for objecting to her turning someone into stone. Aslan is preparing for the coming battle with the forces loyal to the White Witch, and talks to Peter in particular about leading his own army against her. While they're talking, the Queen's killer wolves attack and chase Lucy and Susan up a tree. Aslan decides this is a good chance for Peter to prove himself, and indeed, the lad does surprisingly well and slays the enemy captain, earning him a knighthood from Aslan as Sir Peter Wolfsbane. Aslan instructs his fastest soldiers to follow one of the enemy survivors in the hopes that he will lead them to where Edmund is being held, and this pays off. A very contrite Edmund is rescued, brought before Aslan for a stern talking to, then welcomed back to the family. The jubilation doesn't last too long though, as the witch turns up under a flag of parley and reminds Aslan that there is a deep magic woven into the fabric of Narnia that basically dictates that if anyone ever betrays anyone else, she gets to kill them or the entire world will come to an end which, wow, it's amazing the place has lasted this long if them's the rules. Aslan discusses the matter privately with her, and right afterwards she relinquishes her claim on Edmund's life. No one knows how he did it until Lucy and Sarah see him walking out of the camp that night and accompany him to the stone table, where he has them stay behind and goes on alone to meet the witch and all her monsters. Once there, he allows them to tie him up, muzzle him, and hack all of his lovely mane off. The witch then tells him that despite him having offered to die in Edmund's place, she plans to kill them all the next day anyway, so it will have all been for nothing, and then she kills him with her sacrificial dagger. After the baddies leave, a devastated Susan and Lucy spend the night with his body and are surprised to see an army of field mice chewing his bindings away, and even more surprised the next morning when the stone table cracks in two and Aslan reappears in all his living glory. He had apparently escaped in a loophole. There was a magic the witch didn't know about that's even deeper than the deep magic that says you get to respawn if a non-traitor dies in a traitor's place. Aslan puts his resurrection to good use by running all the way to the witch's castle with the girls on his back and using his magic breath that he apparently has to return all the people she turned to stone to life, including Mr. Tumnus who is reunited with Lucy. He then leads these newly acquired reinforcements to the battle now in progress between Peter's army and the witches. They are just in time as Peter's side seems to be vastly outnumbered and on the brink of losing. If they'd only thought to bring some of the old twirly whirlies! <laughs> Aslan personally kills the witch and her side crumbles. Susan and Lucy discover that Edmund redeemed himself in combat by accepting a mortal wound in exchange for being able to smash the witch's wand so she wouldn't be able to turn anyone else to stone. Fortunately, Lucy is just in time to save his life with her bottle of healing juice and the four children are crowned as kings and queens of Narnia, now and forever. Aslan quietly leaves without saying goodbye, which is apparently pretty normal for him because there are other places he needs to watch over too. Peter, Susan, Lucy and Edmund rule over Narnia justly and fairly and go 
up to be handsome and beautiful adults. One day, after so many years they'd pretty much completely forgotten about their lives before Narnia, they're out hunting for a white magical stag that's known to grant wishes if caught and happen to find the lamppost. Intrigued by this, they go searching around it and come tumbling out of the wardrobe, restored to the age as they were the moment they entered it. The completely unsurprised professor tells them they probably won't be able to use the wardrobe again, but will undoubtedly return to Narnia someday. I really liked this film's attention to small details, like the handkerchief that Lucy gave to Mr. Tumnus that he then gave to Mr. Beaver so that he could prove he was a friend. You don't get a chance to see it very often in the film because she's either standing alone or next to dwarfs or children, but the White Witch is very tall, a remnant of her mixed heritage as part human, part djinn, and part giant. They also remembered funny details like the professor lamenting that schools these days obviously don't teach logic to children anymore because they can't wrap their tiny heads around the possibility of a magic wardrobe. So yeah, that's almost the entire book. Not bad, not bad at all. Let's uh, see what the catch was. Things are presented as rather doom and gloomy for the siblings when they arrive at the professor's country mansion in the film. Originally, they were actually pretty happy to have been put in such a huge, nice-looking house and pretty optimistic about spending time there. And they handle the professor slightly differently in the adaptation, where Mrs. McCready tells them not to disturb him and the kids don't meet him until a good way into the story. In the book, he was there to greet them and make them welcome right from the start and was a continuous, friendly and fatherly figure to them all the time they were in the human world. Mr. and Mrs. Beaver were also a tad more charming in the book, though the film did successfully add a lot of personality to them by making them ever so slightly dysfunctional. You can see a vision of Aslan appearing in the fire to help Tumnus change his mind about kidnapping Lucy. This does him a slight disservice, as he was supposed to change it based purely on his own principles, but gosh that was a well-directed dramatic scene. A quick warning that we may be dropping into the realms of subjective interpretation for a bit here. Books can so often be a different experience for the different people reading them, but sometimes a guy just has to call things how he sees them, you know? If you saw any of the following in a different light, please feel free to let me know in the comments. The film added a new dynamic between Edmund and Peter that somewhat robs Peter of his status as the perfect hero and Edmund of his role as the redeemed foul betrayer. Unlike the book where Peter would only chastise Edmund briefly if he caught him in a particularly cruel act of bullying or nastiness, he now rides him constantly, berating him for any act of disobedience, major, minor, or even just perceived. Film Peter is also constantly trying to force his siblings to withdraw from danger while he stayed confronted, causing strife within the group. He also turned on Edmund way faster once they all found found out that Narnia was indeed real. In the book, even once they were there, it didn't occur to Peter that Edmund was a lying asshole until he accidentally gave himself away by letting slip that he knew where the lamppost was. It doesn't excuse Edmund's actions by any stretch, but it paints a picture of an equally flawed pair who both have a lot of work to do in their brotherly relationship. It's not a bad subplot for a film, but I've always thought that Peter was supposed to be a flawless, perfect knight in the books, the kind you often find in fairy tales like this one. Someone the wee kids could imagine themselves as, or strive to be like. Possibly an unpopular opinion, but Susan was a bit of a non-character in the book. Peter, while also two-dimensional, at least had shit to do, but I cannot for the life of me think of a single unique thing that just Susan did, not as a group. The film seems to have tried to amend this, but unfortunately they did it in exactly the same way they humanised Peter, by making her constantly verbally lash out at her siblings and regularly blame Peter for shit he had nothing to do with. Mrs. McCready is perhaps a bit meaner in the film than she comes off in the book, in which her only crime of sternness was telling the children to stay out of the way when she was giving a tour of the old mansion to visiting historians. It was from one of these tours that the children were fleeing when they hid in the wardrobe, as opposed to her vengeful wrath for breaking a window during a cricket match. While Edmund's first encounter with the witch's dwarf servant was admittedly somewhat more violent in the film, the witch herself was more consistently nice to him from the start, so Edmund comes off as far less of an idiot for trusting her. In the book she basically mutters, well I should probably kill you, wait no never mind, and let's try something else first, and he still buys her subsequent stories hook, line, and sinker. There's a reasonably funny joke in the film where Mrs. Beaver offers the children fish and chips, and it turns out the chips are wood chips, because, you know, beavers. This replaced a rather long part of the book where every delicious thing the kids ate in that meal was described in meticulous detail. I'm not exaggerating, Lewis was clearly really into food porn. He described that meal with the same gusto as I would use to describe Denise Richards. When The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe was being written, C.S. 
Lewis was a middle-aged man living in the 1940s, and you've probably already guessed where I'm going with this. There are some less than progressive messages in regards to gender in this book. While Father Christmas does give Susan and Lucy weapons, as he does so he specifically tells them that they are for self-defense in extreme situations only, and they were not to participate in the battle with the White Witch. When Lucy tells him that she believes that she could find the courage to do so, he tells her that it's not an issue of courage, women are simply not supposed to fight in wars. This was clearly a strongly held belief for C.S. Lewis because those lines were completely unnecessary in the end. Susan and Lucy missed the battle because they, unplanned, ended up going with Aslan to rescue the people the witch had turned to stone. The film takes full advantage of the possible out this gives them from the casual sexism while still staying true to the story. They cut the offending lines and implied the girls were getting ready to participate in the battle just like everyone else and would have done so if they hadn't been needed elsewhere. The only person who suggests they sit it out is Peter and he does the same for Edmund, so whatever. The only thing that could be considered not just a live omission is Susan shooting the witch's personal dwarf henchman right at the end to protect Edmund. I'm going to leave it to y'all to decide for yourselves if toning down the time period sexism is more important than book accuracy. Personally, I think it should be decided on a case-by-case -case basis, and here I'm all in favour of it. If goat men can fight in battles, why not women? In the book, Aslan took Peter's sword from him and slapped him with a flat of it while he was knighting him. Um, I think that was part of the old school way of doing it. He was also described as doing things like clapping his paws together and sitting on a throne, which led me to question if Aslan was actually supposed to be anthropomorphic. Eventually I decided, no, probably not. It's more likely Lewis just didn't think some things through in regards to what a lion can do when they walk on all fours. The witch hadn't met up with her army yet when Aslan's scouts arrived to rescue Edmund from her, and she was mere seconds away from cutting his throat with her knife. To escape her own demise, she cast a spell that made her and her dwarf servant looked like a tree in a boulder until they left. A queen who runs around without a revenue or guard is another one of those things I never really thought to question until adulthood. Aslan gives the four children titles as they are crowned that they were supposed to have earned as they grew up. Edmund in particular probably hadn't earned the name Edmund the Just yet, considering he'd only worn his crown for a few seconds. The first hurdle of any and all film adaptations of books, namely that the audience can no longer be privy to the internal thoughts of the characters or get treated to a straight up explanation of their motivations isn't too big of a problem here, as Lewis didn't delve too much into that way of writing anyway. Keeping it more of a overview narration of all four kids instead of choosing one in particular as a point of view character and sharing the details of their thoughts. You do miss out on knowing a bit more about what Lucy was going through the first time she discovered Narnia on her own, and that Edmund chose not to verify her claims, not so much as you would expect to further his desire to become the future king of Narnia like the witch promised, but out of a juvenile sense of spite and sadism only available to the very young and exceptionally sociopathic. In the book, coming back to life gives Aslan so much joy and energy he runs around playing with the girls for a while like a 450 pound kitten. As the film was cutting back and forth between this scene and the impending battle, the tonal whiplash could have destroyed both our worlds, so it makes sense that they quietly changed that. It's a shame though, I would have killed to hear Liam Neeson yelling, chase me girls, chase me, teehee. The group of statues the kids and beavers find were originally caught in the act by the witch celebrating Christmas. The scene of her executing someone via petrification was used on the fox character I'll talk about in just a second. There was a bit more dilly-dallying around inside the witch's castle in the book, and a rather strange scene where a good-natured and very polite giant breaks down the door to help people escape, and is super into the handkerchief that Lucy gives him to mop his brow. The line that Edmund drew a moustache and glasses on is also super fangirly to be hanging out with Aslan, and gets all giddy when he says stuff like, we lions. Due to so much of the book being included in the film, I'm inclined to forego the what they left out section of this particular review. However, when dealing with a two and a half hour long movie based on a 208 page book, it shouldn't surprise anyone that it has to be replaced with. There's an extra scene of the children actually in the London bombings at the start of the film where Edmund goes back into the house to retrieve a photo of their father and Peter has to drag him out again. The kids reference said father multiple times in the film. In the book, I don't recall them mentioning their parents at all now that I think about it. You have to assume the father was in the war. There's multiple additional action scenes added to the film. The secret police getting to the beaver's dam just before the team could leave it and forcing them to escape through a tunnel for one. Then the big old kerfuffle involving them trying to cross a frozen river that's rapidly thawing 
hunting while also trying to fight off a bunch of wolves that ends in a Lucy death fakeout. The fox, who is initially distrusted by Mr. Beaver, but shortly later risks his life to save them and is turned to stone as punishment, is a film original. As padding goes, he wasn't a bad character. I always like people who are sassy in the face of danger. There's a new scene of Tumnus and Edmund sharing an icy jail cell where Tumnus is understandably hurt to discover that his new friend ratted him out in exchange for gross sweets. After he abandons them, the rest of the group try and fail to catch up with Edmund before he can reach the witch's abode, forcing them to run all the way there, then immediately run all the way back. There's a montage of the kids preparing for battle involving a kid who's never wielded a sword or ridden a horse before being trained to wield a sword and ride a horse by another kid who's never wielded a sword or ridden a horse before. After Aslan's death, the spirits of the trees take it upon themselves to carry this sad news to Peter and his followers. It's never actually confirmed in the book if any of them knew Aslan was dead. He mentioned to Peter the day before while he was giving him tactics lessons that he couldn't guarantee he was going to be able to be there to help him with the battle. I genuinely thought that I would never need to use this section again after I finished the Hobbit reviews, but I guess life really does have a way of surprising you. <laughs> Yes, I do believe we have struck upon the primary reason for this particular film's existence. Two years before, in 2003, The Return of the King had forced us to bid a heartbreaking farewell to Middle-earth and the entire planet was dealing with epic high fantasy withdrawal symptoms. Film studios everywhere not incorrectly guessed that this would be the perfect time to offer a methadone alternative to the Lord of the Rings heroine we were all desperately jonesing for more of, considering that a Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe adaptation was pretty much inevitable. Wait, didn't Tolkien have a BFF who also wrote best-selling fantasy novels? Yes, but I think they were intended for really young children. That's not a deal-breaker, what's really important is, did they have huge battles in them? They did, but I'm pretty sure they always happened off-screen. Not anymore. So, yeah, this pretty thoroughly explains why Peter and Edmund's Clash of the Witch went from half a page of the book to half an hour of the film. It also goes away to explaining why the film starts with a German air raid over London despite the book beginning with the children arriving at the professor's house. You've got to have an opening battle. If you don't have an opening battle, then there's no opening battle. This in of itself isn't too offensive to me. Unlike the makers of the Hobbit films, the guys who adapted the line The Witch and the Wardrobe took influence from Rings, but remembered to respect their own book first and didn't try any crowbarring business with incompatible tone. And there certainly are worse things you could take influence from than the greatest trilogy of films in human history, and as Rings impersonators go, this one is pretty fucking good. The battle is satisfyingly epic, the score is suitably grandose, complementing each scene perfectly, and the fight choreography isn't bad at all, creatively taking into account how creatures other than humans might fight with various medieval weapons. However, there were a few occasions where they possibly took just a little too much inspiration from their senpai film and danced over the line into straight up plagiarism. I'm such an asshole. <sighs> the Dom's final thoughts. Considering the general competence of this film's production, the budget that allowed it to do justice to all the things described in the book, the reasonable to good performances, and the respect it showed to its source material, I was genuinely surprised to discover that the general opinion on it, while leaning towards the favourable, is undeniably predominantly middle ground for most people. Very few people seem to hate it, but yeah, lukewarm seems to be the general feeling. I've not seen them yet, but I'm given to understand that this film's sequel are not as dedicated to being good adaptations as it was, so perhaps this is partly due to opinions being clouded by association. The sheer length of the film might also be a factor. While I personally liked the battle, it could have been a lot shorter and resulted in a punchier film. It can't be denied that adaptation-wise this is a very high scorer. There's very, very little of the book not paid homage to in at least some form, which is great to see in a film that was almost certainly originally conceived as a cash-in. It's a short book, and the filmmakers clearly chose to milk every last scene from it to meet the runtime requirements instead of adding in entirely new segments to the plot. I prefer this option overall. So yeah, a damn good adaptation that I think deserves more recognition. Even though it's already got plenty, but what can I say when they put the effort in? I... Okay, ow. You know what, I'm just gonna call it. I'll see you next time, my beautiful watchers.
Just before I go, my beautiful watchers, I just wanted to say that I really appreciate all the support I've received since I talked about my health issues and how they were forcing me to change my performance and talk softer. It really is appreciated. Other people seem to have found it oddly appealing and keep referencing ASMR videos, which is a little strange to me, but I figured fuck it, might as well lean into that shit. Hello, my beautiful watchers. You look really nice today. If you're not subbed to the channel, maybe consider caressing that like button and ringing that bell. I don't usually include the bell because I figure people will watch my shit when they're good and ready, it doesn't have to be right when I upload it. Anyway, if you're not following me on Twitter, you're missing out on some really nice gym pics, so there's that. And uh, if you are enjoying yourself here, feel free to tell your friends all about the experience. And uh, be sure to like and comment to keep that naughty algorithm away. See you soon.